All right, uh, this is the first class that we've had back. Uh, we were off, I, I went to Colorado to see the grandkids uh, one week and then was preempted, I think, five weeks and then came back and did two or three weeks and then was preempted three weeks. So it's been a while since we've been back. Our last class was uh, January 11th and you may have been hoping that we just forget Hebrews, but you're not that fortunate, you see. We're gonna carry on. Uh, We're going to carry on with Hebrews, but what I want to do this morning is have an extended review because we've been away so long. I have, since we last met, I have put on my website the outline of Hebrews that I'm following, which I took from uh, uh, George Guthrie. Uh, You have that up there, you have the introduction to Hebrews, and you have my notes on the first eight chapters of Hebrews. So when I finish the rest, I'm I'm now in preparation, I'm up into chapter 13, but when I finish the rest, I'll put those up there so the whole book will be up there. But uh, if you've not been to the site, uh, check it out. I put the stuff up there, I don't have advertising, I make nothing out of it, I just make it available in the hope that it might be useful to somebody. So there's some 1,300 pages of stuff that I've written over the years, so uh, as I wrote to Nancy, when you're really bored, you want to go there and check that out, okay? But, uh, all right, I wanted to go with an extended review here. Uh, you indulge me in that because, as I say, it's been a while since we've, uh, we've been together. And, uh, you know, if you've got all this tuned in and it's just killing you, you just nod off. And when we get to the new stuff, I'll sound an alarm or something, all right? <clears throat> but I want to bring us back into the flow of the book of Hebrews because, as I have stressed, and I always stress when I'm teaching, it's important to track the author, the inspired writer's flow of thought. You know, the Bible can be abused so easily if you just parachute in and pull out texts. That's what every group does. You have to track, to use the Bible responsibly, you have to track the flow of thought so you know the context in which statements are made. So that's why I spend a lot of time on doing that. So let me try to bring us back to that. We obviously aren't going to finish the book of Hebrews by February. As well, as it said on the other thing, it's supposed to end in February. We're not going to be able to do that. Now, uh, my plan is I'm just going to carry into the next quarter uh, unless I'm told otherwise. We'll just go into the next quarter. I'll take at least, I'm guessing, half of that quarter, and then I'll just choose to teach something else that'll go for the rest of that. I have some ideas on what I want to teach after that, but I haven't settled on anything. So that's what we'll do. Now, with many uh, modern scholars back on a review of Hebrews, I believe that Hebrews was written to a group of Christians who were being tempted to reject Christianity and to return to some form of of Judaism. Now, many of these were no doubt ethnic Jews who had converted to Christ, but you probably also had some Gentiles who had affiliated with Judaism, either as proselytes, you know, Gentiles who'd converted, or as God-fearers, those who'd hung out at the synagogue and very interested but had never formally converted. Now, what was tempting them to revert to Judaism, it's only hinted at, but it seems to have included their being tired of bearing the rejection of the Jewish community. I mean, this was their cultural heritage, and they were getting ostracized and put down and just basically left out by family, friends, and that kind of thing, and that's a drag. It also seemed to involve uh, some kind of blurring of the distinctiveness of Jesus Christ and also quite possibly a fear of persecution, which was no doubt contributed to by the fact Judaism was recognized as an official religion by the Roman Empire, but Christianity was not. Okay, so you can see how if you're involved in Judaism and that has some protection of recognition as a formal religion, Christianity doesn't. Uh, You can see how, uh uh-oh, you know, if I'm identified with Christianity, I have a greater potential of getting the hammer. Okay, so that may have been playing in. In fact, it looks like it was playing into it. Now, the purpose of the letter was to urge these Christians to hold fast to their confession of faith and the theme that he sounds in urging them to do that and in keeping them from turning from the Christian faith is the unqualified supremacy of Christ. He just talks about this over and over. That is the theme. You know, it, it's into paraphrase. You know, when Peter says, you know, to whom should we go? You know, where do you turn? from Jesus Christ. There's nowhere to turn. And so this is the theme that he sounds, and he does it in a particular context. Now, the recipients uh, of this letter probably were a segment of the Roman church, perhaps one or more predominantly Jewish house churches 
within the Roman church, and we talked about that in the first couple of weeks. Now, if that's correct, then the letter's probably written in the mid-60s, just prior to the extreme persecution against the Roman church that broke out under Emperor Nero. So if you think of some house churches, predominantly Jewish, mid-60s in Rome, you're on the verge, you know, there are straws in the wind of persecution. Uh, the Roman Empire is making rumblings about these Christians, you know, they're bad guys, enemies of the empire and this kind of thing. You've got your Jewish family blowing you off and not having anything to do with you. So there's great pressure. And I've said, you know, this is a very relevant book because in Churches of Christ, and I, I think in all religious groups, they, they're concerned about keeping young people. You know, people grow up and what happened? You know, closing the back door. Well, what is happening in our society is that people are being tempted to turn and go back to the world. Their culture, their friends, they are ostracizing them for their commitment to Jesus Christ. They feel the pressure of being different. Okay, they feel the pressure and it is pulling that they want to turn and go back into that cultural heritage, so to speak. So I just think it's a very relevant book for uh, the kinds of things that we focus on and talk about. Now, as for the development and the structure of the argument, I mentioned I'm following the idea of uh, George Guthrie as presented in his 1998 commentary in the New International Version Application Commentary Series. Now, he wrote, I mentioned before, he wrote his doctoral dissertation on the structure of Hebrews, and his analysis of the book has been well received by scholars, not unanimous. I mean, that's just, that never happens. You have people who think, no, we're still searching. But it seems to make sense to me. And what he, how he understands the book, he sees the structure. Hebrews is switching back and forth between expounding on the person and work of the Son of God and exhorting the congregation to a positive response. So you have exposition, and then interspersed in the exposition, you have exhortation. So he'll be doing something on the Son of God, doing an exposition on that, then he'll pause and come on and urge them, warn them to come on and... and and hold fast and, and do the things that shake out from what he's just said about Jesus Christ. And you see that, uh, I think, clearly through the book. And I, as I said, I, I put the outline, uh, his outline up. I just changed the format. I did it in a little different format, but it's his outline that I put up there on that website. Now, let me run through where we've been uh, in the text. I'll do this quickly, but I just want to pick back up so if you're new here and we do have some new people, you'll at least know how I understand it. As I say all the time, what I do in teaching, I work on it. I, I take it seriously. I give you my best understanding. I, I invite you to share my understanding. Okay? I can't make you agree with me about anything. I tell you how I understand things. All I ask is that you give it a hearing. Consider it. If you think it's junk, if you think it's off base, okay, well, then you keep searching. Okay, but I give you how I understand something, and that's, that's what I do. So I want, to, I want to tell you, pick us up at the beginning of the book and take us down to where we left off, and then we'll carry on with some new things, okay? And the introduction in the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 1, the writer, he makes the point that the Son, Jesus Christ, is the climax of divine communication. And then he makes some powerful assertions about the person, work, and status of the Son. Then in chapter 1, verses 5 through 14, he stresses that the Son is superior to the angels. Then given that superiority, he says in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he warns them to pay even greater attention than they have been to what they've heard, which is the word spoken through the Son, the message of salvation. Okay, that, so he, he kind of pauses and gives the first warning there. That's the first exhortation, the interjection of exhortation. And then in chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, he resumes the, the exposition on Christ that was interrupted, so to speak, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And he explains that the superior son, for a time, became positionally lower than the angels. Then in verses 10 through 18 of chapter 2, we see that the son became lower than the angels. He became a human subject to human authority. Okay, you don't have angels having humans spit on them and crucify. He became a human subject to human authority when he could smoke this reality. But he submitted himself to these people. He said, you know, Pilate saw him, don't you know I have the power to crucify you? He says, you got nothing over me if it wasn't given to you. Okay, so he becomes lower than the angels in that sense. 
he, he became lower, he became a human subject to human authority. And in verses 10 through 18, we see that he did this to nullify the devil's work. He became a human being to conquer human mortality, to conquer death by providing through his sacrifice for sin, resurrection life for the children of God, and through that to free them fully from the fear of death. You see, resurrection is death's defeat, it's reversal. And so that's what he's come and he has accomplished that. He defeated death through his crucifixion and resurrection and we'll see the full effects of that victory. He's already won the victory. The back has been broken, but we'll see the full effects of that victory when he returns at his second coming. And the analogy that's used a lot of times is like with D-Day and V-E Day, the, the victory. Okay, D-Day was the end. I mean, the Nazis were through. But there was this time delay until that, that victory was fully realized. That's how it is with Christ. Death has been defeated, but we await the finalization of that. The final expression of that victory in the resurrection of his second coming. Okay, verses 17 and 18 of chapter 2, they lead into the central section of Hebrews that focuses on Jesus' high priesthood. He's introducing this subject, but before he gets to that, we have another one of these sections of exhortation. Okay, so we, we have a section of exhortation that runs from chapter 3, verse 1, down through chapter 4, verse 13. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, we're given the negative example of the Israelites who fell through faithlessness. Okay, remember, you, you're, you have people who are being tempted to turn from Christ, so he uses that example very powerfully and tells them, listen, you know, don't be like that, because you see what happened to them. Then in chapter 3, verses 7 through 19, I'm sorry, chapter 3, 1 through 6, Jesus is presented as a supreme example of the faithful son, okay, the, one who is considered worthy of much greater honor than Moses. And then it's in chapter 3, verses 7 through 19 that we get the negative example of the Israelites uh, who fell through faithlessness. Then in chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, 1 and 2, he makes a transition from the, the Israelite wanderers, okay, he transitions from that to the promise of rest today. And then in chapter 4, verses 3 through 11, he develops the promise of rest for those who are faithful. Okay, and all of this is good stuff, and it's, you know, they're lessons in themselves, but I'm just kind of racing through this to remind you of what we've talked about. Then in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 4, he warns them that there are no secrets from God. Okay, now he enters into the main section of the book of Hebrews, the principal section, chapter 4, verse 14, through chapter 10, verse 25, which is an exposition on the high priesthood of Christ. Okay, in chapter 4, 14 through 16, we are told that we have a sinless high priest who's gone into heaven and that we therefore must hold firmly to the faith and draw near to God or his high, this high priest will be of no use to us. If we abandon the faith in Jesus Christ, this wonderful high priest who's gone into heaven will be of no use to us. In chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, he states that Jesus was designated a high priest on the order of Melchizedek, and then he interrupts this exposition he has on the high priesthood of Jesus for another section of exhortation. Okay, he's going to, he interrupts it, and this section goes from 511 to the end of chapter 6. All right, he's in the central section. The central section is an exposition on the high priesthood of Christ. He gets into it, and then after the first 10 verses of chapter 5, we have another uh, interjection of exhortation. Okay, that runs from 511 to the end of chapter 6, and at 511 through 14, he tells his hearers that rather than being content with and only interested in an infant's diet of the basics of the Christian faith, they need to move beyond those things. They need to allow God to move them toward a fuller, deeper grasp of the faith. And this is important. The basics are obviously basic. They're fundamental. They're essential. But you cannot stay there. Okay, and there are temptations in the church to want to stay there, and we have a number of reasons for doing that, but you cannot. We have to go on to deeper things. And that's what the Hebrew writer is telling them, flat out. Okay, they need to go on and move beyond this, the, a fixation on these simple ABCs and go to the deeper things of faith. In chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, he lists three pairs of teachings that he includes among the basic things. Six items that, in the words of Craig Coaster, who's a commentator, six items that span the journey of faith from initial repentance 
to final judgment. See, it's his hope and intention that they will indeed go beyond these things, that they will awaken or repent of their regression into an infant mindset so that they can receive the meteor things that he's going to give them. This is very important. It's important for Christians to move beyond the basics because as he indicates in chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, failing to do so increases the danger not only that they'll fall into sin and be alienated from God, as terrible as that is, but it increases the danger that they will fall beyond repentance, that they will fall beyond the ability to come back. So he gives them a worst case scenario to stress the importance of moving toward maturity. We need to do that. We have to do that. There is danger in camping on ABCs. Okay, now we, we think sometimes, well, if you go into too much into theology, then you get divisions and problems. We don't have a choice. Okay, I know it's difficult. And we need to be charitable about disagreements and all that. But we have to build the church. We have to go beyond. All right, and that's what the writer is telling them. And he's going to do it, as you know, because when he gets into Melchizedek, we're getting into some far out stuff. Okay, it's pretty, I mean, he's getting into some stuff. It's important for them to do that, okay, because of this worst case scenario. Then in nine, verses 9 and through 12 of chapter 6, he says that despite the grave state in which fall, failing to move toward maturity can lead, okay, this worst case scenario of falling beyond the ability to return, despite that, he's confident that they will receive the blessings of salvation. Okay, he's encouraging them here. Now he's confident of that because they've been and continue to be living in, in faith and his concern is that they be diligent to the end. That's what this is about. Diligent to the end. Faithful to the end. Not burning brightly and then dying. As John and I joke often, it's a, it, you know, we say it's a long run to the grave. Faithful till death. Okay, here are these people, storms, difficulties, hardships in life, all of that kind of stuff. Tempting you to go back faithful to the end. Okay? You need to hang on and he's encouraging to do that. Then in verses 13 through 20, he reinforces the appeal to steadfastness by explaining that God's promise to Abraham, of which they are heirs, will without doubt be received through patient faithfulness, just as it was in the case of Abraham. Okay? So he's using Abraham. He says, listen... The promise of Abraham of which you're heirs, it will without doubt be received. It's not going to be one of these things where you are faithful to the end, faithful throughout, and you get there and it's, eh, uh -huh. joke's on you. I didn't have the power to pull it off. Not going to happen. Okay, will without doubt receive these blessings. And in 1920 of chapter 6, he brings the sermon back to where he was in chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. He brings it back to, to where he was there. He said he had more to say about Melchizedek. He then has this hortatory interjection. And then at the end there, he brings it back to where he was. Okay, he brings it back to Melchizedek and he does have more to say. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 3 is an exposition on Melchizedek who serves as a type of Christ. And I spent a lot of time talking about that. He serves as a type of Christ in that he is a type of eternal, non-Levitical, not a descendant of Levi. He's a type of eternal, non-Levitical priest. What he foreshadows as a type, Jesus fulfills as the reality. In chapter 7, verses 4 through 10, the author says that Melchizedek's priesthood is greater than the... So see, he's a type of Christ, and then he says... Melchizedek's priesthood is greater than the, than the Levitical priesthood because Melchizedek was greater than Abraham, who is the ancestor of the Levitical priest. So if he's greater than the ancestor of the Levit Levitical priest, his priesthood is greater than theirs, and Jesus is a Melchizedekian kind of priest. Okay, so he makes that point in, in, in verses 4 through 10. Then in 11 through 28 of chapter 7, he discusses the superiority of Jesus our eternal Melchizedekian high priest. Verses 11 through 19 of chapter 7, he says that the introduction of the new priesthood in Christ resulted in the setting aside of the Mosaic law and the arrival of a better hope, a hope through which we draw near to God. It's better. What Christ has brought is better, superior. So why are you thinking about turning? To whom shall we go? Jesus is superior. Everything is better. He says in verse 20 through 25 that unlike the Levitical priests, 
Jesus called the priesthood, it includes an irrevocable oath that his priesthood will last forever, drawing on Psalm 110.4, which means that he's become a guarantee of a better covenant. See, because his priesthood is permanent, he's able to save fully or for all time those who come to God through him since he's always there to make intercession. The priesthood will never be passed to somebody who is less adequate, less able. His priesthood is permanent. He always will be there to make intercession for us. Okay, so he's the guarantee of a better covenant. Then in verses 26 and 28 of chapter 7, he makes the point that Jesus is the kind of high priest we need. See, one with a character and status greater than the earthly priests. Chapter, we're getting to where we left off. <laughs> we're getting there. All right, chapter 8, verses 1, 1 and 2, he identifies the main point of what he's been saying. And I always like it when an inspired writer stops and says, now here's the main deal of what I'm talking about. Okay? He identifies the main point of what he's saying, namely that Christians have the kind of high priest he has described. You see, one who's sinless, eternal, sympathetic, and was appointed by an oath. And this high priest, Jesus Christ, he ministers not in an earthly sanctuary, but he ministers in heaven itself where he sits at the right hand of God the Father. Everything superior, everything better. Chapter 8, verses 3 through 6, he says that every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. And so Jesus, being a high priest, he also has to have something to offer. And his offering, it was specified in chapter 7, verse 27, he offered himself. He offered himself once for all as a sacrifice for sin. Now he notes that if Jesus were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest. Because if he were on earth, he would then be ministering under the old covenant, which permitted only descendants of Aaron to be priests, and he's not a descendant of Aaron. He's on the order of Melchizedek, who's a type of non-Levitical priest. Okay, so he, if, if he were ministering on earth, he'd be ministering under the old covenant, he wouldn't be a priest. Because only descendants of Aaron could be priests. But Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant, he says in 3 through 6. And in conjunction with that covenant, he obtained a heavenly ministry that is superior to the earthly ministry of the Levitical priests. Okay? He says this new covenant is a better covenant that was enacted or founded on better promises. Then in chapter 8, verses 7 through 13, he elaborates on this new covenant. And that's where we left off. And I'll repeat a little bit about what I said, and then we'll carry on to some new things. But in Hebrews chapter 8, beginning in verse 7, he says, For if that first covenant was faultless, a place for a second would not have been sought. For finding fault with them, he says, now he's going to quote Jeremiah, and I, I indicate that by the, the block indentation. He says, look, days are coming, says the Lord, and I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took, them, I took their hand to lead them from the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I had no concern for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them upon their hearts. And I will be God to them and they will be a people to me. And they shall not teach. Each one his fellow citizen and each one his brother saying, Know the Lord. For all will know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities. And I will not remember their sins any longer. When he says new... He has made the first obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and is becoming old is on the verge of disappearance. Let me go back to the last slide here so we can talk about this first part a bit. Now the superiority of the new covenant that Jesus has introduced is evident from the fact there would have been no need for God to announce in Jeremiah's day the coming of a new covenant if the first covenant meaning the Mosaic Covenant, as he makes clear in verse 9. There would have been no need for him to announce the coming of a new covenant if the first covenant had been sufficient for achieving God's ultimate purpose. Okay, that wasn't its, its purpose, that wasn't its design. Verse 13 makes clear that the key for the, the writer of Hebrews, the key for him from the Jeremiah text, is the use of the word new to describe the covenant that God was going to establish. See, by calling that covenant new, 
He indicated that the Mosaic Covenant with its mandated priesthood and sacrifices, all of that package of things, he indicated, see, that that was destined for obsolescence. It was something that was transitory. It would be replaced. That was in the intent of God. When he announced that in Jeremiah, it was clear that the old covenant was designed for obsolescence because he called this one new. So that was on the way out. What's in that category, what's been destined by God for obsolescence, is expiring, is on the brink of disappearing, however long it may totter there. When he called that new, that baby was history. Okay, let me read you a couple commentators, their point on that. He says, Harold Attridge, he says, in Hebrews' eyes... The old covenant was near its end as soon as the oracle was spoken. F.F. Bruce says that by predicting the inauguration of a new covenant, Jeremiah, in effect, announced the impending dissolution of the old order. And I'll spare you Fitzer's comment because we already went through that. Okay? So this is what's happening. It's already gone. It's fading. Okay, when he announces that, however long it totters there. Now, we know from what the author's already written that the old covenant it passed away in the crucifixion, resurrection, and exaltation of Christ. He's clear about that. When you see in chapter 7, verses 22, 18 to 22, chapter 8, verse 6, and this is confirmed in numerous other places in the New Testament, that, that the old covenant passed. It was, it was made obsolete in the crucifixion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Indeed, the writer of Hebrews, he's stressed throughout, right? He stressed the fact that Jesus is serving as the high priest under the new covenant. Okay, he came and he was the mediator of this new covenant. It is under that new covenant that he's serving as the great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, in God's immediate presence. Okay, so this old covenant is, is taken away in the, in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the new covenant is made, he says in verse 10, with the house of Israel. Okay, he says it's made with the house of Israel he refers to the same group in verse 8 in terms of the divided monarchy of Israel and Judah. But this covenant, this new covenant is made with the house of Israel. And you think about that, the church, of course, is Jewish at its root, right? I mean, weren't the apostles and the first Christians, they're Jews, right? These, they, they were Jews, they were true Israel. They were true Israel, meaning they were ethnic Jews right, who shared the faith of Abraham in that they believe God's testimony about his son, Jesus Christ. Those who, sh Abraham's a man of faith. It is not, you know, ethnic Jews are one thing. And then you have the true Jew is the one who walks in the footsteps of Abraham's faith. Well, the apostles in the early church, they were ethnic Jews who were true Israel because not only were they ethnic Jews, but they also shared Abraham's faith in that they believed what God said about Jesus. Okay, so that's, here you have when it says he makes this covenant with Israel. That's right. He makes the covenant with Israel. I mean, that's almost certainly why Jesus chose 12 apostles. I mean, do you think it's a coincidence that he chose 12 apostles when you have 12 tribes of Israel? You see, he chose 12 apostles. They signified, see, the righteous remnant, the faithful subset of ethnic Israel. They are the people who are faithful. Why? Because they believe God's testimony about Jesus. So they are the ones walking in the faith of Abraham because God said it. They said, I believe it. All the rest who said, I don't believe it. You're ethnic Jews, but you're not really children of Abraham. So you're not really children of Abraham. So you see this, uh, Robert Stein in his book, Jesus the Messiah, he says, the symbolic nature of their number, talking about the apostles, was not accidental. Jesus' audience could not have helped but notice the number. Twelve conjured up in the mind of any Jew the twelve tribes of Israel. Now as Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse 17 through 24, you see, Israel is what? The olive tree. Okay, this covenant is made with Israel. Israel is the olive tree into which, into which Gentiles have what? Been grafted by faith. Okay, so you have ethnic Israel, then you have true Israel. Who is that? That's Israel that is the subset of ethnic Israel. Israel of faith. Israel who believe God's testimony. Into true Israel is grafted what? Gentiles by faith. They are the root. We are grafted in, we are together then, Jew and Gentile, we are what? The new Israel. 
You see? Ethnic Israel in the faith of Abraham, the covenant is made and we are grafted into it by faith. The faith into which we enter this covenant is the faith that marks us as children of Abraham. Right? We are children of Abraham because we walk in the faith of Abraham because we are Christians. The faith by which we enter that covenant marks us as the children of Abraham. You see that in Romans chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, chapter 9, verse 6 through 8, Galatians 3, 7 through 9, Galatians 3, 29. You also see Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, 11 through 13, he says that Gentiles who once were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, okay, alienated from the commonwealth, strangers to the covenants of promise, what? They've been brought near through the blood of Christ. We've been grafted into Israel. Okay, Jesus is a Davidic king, right? He's the descendant of David. You know, that's why people say, well, is the Jew, you know, is the church anti-Semitic? I tell them I worship a Jewish Lord. What are you talking about? You know, my king, my Lord, my Savior is a descendant of David. And I've been grafted into Israel by faith. But see, this thing when he says that the covenant's made with Israel, people think, oh, that's us. It is made with Israel, and we've been grafted into Israel. Okay? Now, Paul almost certainly refers to the church as the Israel of God. There's some debate about that, but I think it's clear. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, and in Philippians 3, 3, he says, it is we who are the circumcision. We who are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. Okay? So I don't want you, you know, sometimes people see that and they think, well, this somehow... It excludes us. No, no, that can't be what we're talking about because that's made with their... No, that's us. You see, that's us. Now let me look here in the, in the second part of this. There are a couple of aspects of this covenant that I think are interesting. They're difficult to, to understand, I believe. I'm going to give you my ideas on them. Okay, but there are two aspects of this covenant. He says, unlike the Mosaic covenant which the Israelites broke, those in the new covenant will have God's laws put in their minds and written on their hearts. So there's clearly a distinction he's making here between the Mosaic Covenant and this New Covenant, and it is a distinction that somehow relates to the internalization of God, of His will, okay? And what I think that is referring to is that it means that all members of the New Covenant will have the indwelling Spirit, and by virtue of His transforming work, will have a greater desire and ability to obey the will of God, we will be more internally motivated and empowered to live godly lives than were those under the old covenant, generally speaking. Okay? I understand that you, you know, great people of faith and all this, but I think generally speaking, there is covenant-wide, we have the indwelling spirit, and he has transforming work in our lives. And one of the things that, you know, I, I won't call it a hobby horse, but one of the things that I, uh, I really think we need to stress I really think the church needs to stress is that there was power in Christ for godly living. People do not want to come to a Savior who leaves them in the same position they were, but say, but you're forgiven now. You see, a Christian, as I've said ad nauseum, is not the same person in a new situation. He or she is a new person in a new situation. You are not the same person. There is power in Christ to be different. Power in Christ to overcome the things that had enslaved you. I mean, you know this in your life. I hope you know this in your life. Things that you struggle with. When you become a Christian, there is power to be different, to walk holy, godly. And you've got to tell people that who are enslaved in sin because they want it. They don't want to be told, by the way, you're going to stay in the gutter, but don't worry about it because you'll be forgiven. They will, you know, be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Okay, I think what he's talking about, what he's referring to here, is this transforming work of the indwelling Spirit of God. Okay, and you can see, for example, Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, and then I'll skip to 12 and 13. He says, but you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, this one is not of him. There's no such thing as a spiritless Christian. Okay, we know that. You're a Christian. God's spirit is in you. He dwells in you. However you want to think about the mechanics of that. But he dwells in you. 
Okay, no such thing as a spiritless Christian. Then in verse 12, he says, Now therefore, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you, you got a role to play, by the Spirit you are putting to death the practices of the body, you will live. There is something about the indwelling Spirit who transforms us, who changes us. There is something distinctive about the new covenant in that aspect with regard to our internal motivation to serve God. And I see it as the work of the Spirit. You see in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, that the Corinthians' existence as a group of Christians is Paul's letter of recommendation. Okay, Their existence as a group of Christians is his letter of recommendation. It was a letter that was authored by Christ himself but it was brought into being through the agency of the apostle. Just like somebody might dictate a letter. He's the author, but we have somebody who's bringing that into being. That's how it is with the Corinthians. They were Paul's, they were Paul's letter of recommendation. Christ used Paul to write Paul's own letter of recommendation through the transforming work of the spirit in the Corinthians' heart that accompanied the presentation of the gospel in Corinth. You could look at them and see what happened to them. They've been changed. They're different. As Paul brought them, he says, they're my letter of recommendation. I brought the gospel to them, they're transformed part. So I think that's what he's talking about here. Okay, when he says that there's something distinctive about the new covenant, distinguishes it from the old, somehow there is an internalization, and I believe that is connected to the indwelling spirit. Okay, that we are more internally motivated and empowered to live godly lives, generally speaking. Because all who are in the new covenant all share in God's spirit. Now, this is, this, uh, the effect of this in our transformation of the spirit coming into our lives, it is profound. Aha! It is profound. I actually listened to the bell, so don't panic. It's, it's profound. You know, the, the transforming work of the spirit in our lives is profound, but it's subject to this now and not yet dichotomy. I've talked about that before. You never know how much of this stuff sticks, how many times you've got to repeat something before somebody uh, hears you on it. But you see that, that we are in an age now, an overlap of ages, where the kingdom of God has been inaugurated. It's as though the not yet, the future has been pulled into the now. So we share in the yet to come, in a sense, but we still live in an overlap of ages. Okay, so we have this trans, the Spirit is in us, He's transforming us, He's changing us into Christ's likeness, but that transformation will not be complete. We will not be morally perfect until He comes. Then, as He says in 1 John 3 2, then we'll be like Him. Until then, you and I live in an overlap of ages so that, as Peter says, I urge you to abstain from sinful desires that war against your souls. Okay, but we still participate in the age to come in the now. Okay, but it's in that. But I just wanted you to know that there's a struggle. So I'm not saying that, well, yes, every, every Christian has the spirit in them. Then every Christian is Jesus right here. No, I mean, in a sense we are. But you and I struggle. And we will struggle. Okay, but we take discipleship seriously. We seek to live to honor Christ. Okay, and he works in us to do that. Every spiritual victory we have is through his power and his working, right? We're simply cooperating and trying to get out of the way as he molds us. So whenever, whenever there's anything that we are Christ-like, to, who gets the glory? To God be the glory. Because what has he done? He's come in and taken somebody like me and pounding, pounding, pounding. Okay? And if I will quit blocking, see? then we can accelerate the process. But if I block, 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 okay, well, he'll get in some, you know. But it's still his work in my life that is doing that. Now, the second thing that he mentions that I don't have time really to talk about is that all members of the new covenant will know the Lord. Okay, let me just tell you how I see this, uh, and I'll talk about this more next week. Uh, they know the Lord. I think he's talking about in the sense they will experience a level of relationship with him that previously had been exceptional, something that was experienced by relatively few. I think he is knowing the Lord. He's referring to a sense of intimacy with God. I think there is a difference in the new covenant from the old 
in that there is available in the new a greater level of intimacy, and that greater level of intimacy is tied to the greater character of Christ's forgiveness. He has a forgiveness that succeeds in cleansing even our consciences, which is a barrier to intimacy with God. And the reason I think there's a difference, there is forgiveness in the Old Testament, okay? There is forgiveness there, but there is some way in which the forgiveness, and why is there forgiveness there? It is forgiven because of Christ, right? His atoning death is the basis of all forgiveness. But when he appeared in history, I now see Jesus Christ, when we're getting forgiven through the blood of goats and animals, that's not really what's forgiving us. What's forgiving us? The blood of Christ who's to come. Well, once he comes now, as I look at the blood of goats and animals, I have an intuitive awareness of their inherent inadequacy for atonement. So there is this nagging sense of guilt. Yes, 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 there's forgiveness, but there is a barrier to intimacy. When the Son of God came and gave his life, that barrier is gone, and I am now free for complete intimacy with God. And I think this is what he means in this thing about they'll all know the God because there is a covenant-wide intimacy with God because all who are in the new covenant have experienced the fuller, completer forgiveness and mercy that is there in Jesus Christ. Okay? So I'll repeat a lot of that next week, but we're through. Thank you for coming. Even if Wayne didn't ring the bell, I say it. <laughs>